following is a presentation of the High Spot Podcast. Making their way to the ring. Talking about the world of professional wrestling. The team of Jeff Martin and the trendsetter, Brian Perga. The Jersey Wrecking Crew. What is going on, guys? You're listening to the High Spot Podcast on Bodyslam.net. This is an exclusive interview with ECW former star C.W. Anderson. So he was kind enough to sit down with myself and talk about the early start of ECW and his career all the way to the very end of ECW. So we all want to thank Cassidy Haynes for setting up this interview. And man, when I sat down and I just listened to all the stories from ECW, I wanted to keep on going. You're going to find out his passion for ECW. He's got his thoughts on the current product, on Kenny Omega, on AEW, as well as his thoughts on the revival. So without further ado, here is former ECW star C.W. Anderson on the High Spot Podcast. All right, guys, this is Jeff Martin from the High Spot Podcast with a Bodyslam.net exclusive. We're talking to C.W. Anderson. He joins us right now on the line. C.W., how are you doing today? How is everything? I'm good, man. How are you doing? I'm doing good. So, uh, CW, tell me, what's the latest? What's going on with you now? Where where can we currently find you? What are you up to? Still wrestling on the independent scene, working a normal job Monday through Thursday, and then wrestling on the weekend. Just, you know, married. Um, just living, basically. <laughs> I know, right? Stay healthy. Exactly. So let's let's start. You know, early in your career, like what led you to have this passion for wrestling? Obviously, you're still doing it right now. Uh, you're doing it on the weekends. So what led to your passion uh, for professional wrestling? When I when I grew up, I really didn't care for wrestling at all. I wasn't one of these guys that wanted to be a professional wrestler my entire life. My first love and gift was baseball. I got signed out of high school by the San Diego Padres. That when baseball fell through with me blowing out my elbow. I liked it because I had to go back. Before baseball, uh, I, know, I didn't like wrestling. My brother talked me into watching a match with him one day, and I'll never forget what match it was. It was the Rock and Roll Express versus the Russian, which was Crusher Khrushchev and Ivan Koloff in this match, and it was for the NWA uh, World Tag Team titles. And the Russians lost the belts to the, to the Rock and Roll Express, and I remember my brother and I, we were, let's see, my, I was 13 or 12 or 13 at the time and we were jumping around you know like little kids because we thought wrestling was quote unquote real i kind of got hooked watching it right there but i never really took it seriously until after baseball fell through and i was looking for something to do on the weekends and ran into a guy that i knew that doing the independent wrestling and he talked me into going to him with a show to a show i got there early and he got in the ring started rolling around and caught the bug and uh i've been in the ring ever since and that's where i I just started you know my love for it i enjoyed watching it but i never thought in a million years i would be a wrestler but once i got in the ring started rolling around i was like yeah i'm kind of enjoying this and just you know day by day it just went further uh san diego padres what what was your position you were a pitcher i was a catcher catcher Um, 1989 before the latin explosion came through my idol who have a tattoo of on my ankles was benito santiago and he was the one he was a catcher for the padres and when the padres was come scouting it was an all-star game and they didn't even they weren't even there to scout me they were there to scout my pitcher and then when they saw me they clocked me throwing hard to second base from my knees and then the pitcher could throw off the mound he threw at 88 and from my knees to second base they clocked me at 90 and i threw out two runners picked one off third all from my knees and then they talked to my parents after that about being interested in signing me yeah it's not a bad gig to uh be a, a catcher or be a professional baseball player especially now with uh, the crazy amount of money that uh you know they're getting yeah. now i went and played college ball and blew out my elbow showing off going uh trying to throw somebody out at first base pick somebody out for first and blew my elbow out i was like right right now my, my arm doesn't my right arm does not extend fully my left one will but my right one only goes to about 45 degrees because of it oh wow so again there's injuries in all kinds of sports right and you yeah. know your passion well you know you getting that bug for wrestling led you to doing this now listen you're well known for your ecw days right so let's we'll jump into that uh real quick okay. talk about your ecw days because right now i'm sure you've worked with uh, bully ray and um he's compared a lot about what's going on in wrestling now this boom going on 
to basically what ECW started, you know, when they had their first pay-per-view, what AEW and uh, what the Young Bucks and Cody are doing with All In. It kind of had that bit of a feeling. Uh, just your thoughts being there in the early stages of ECW, what kind of feeling did you get when you were part of it? When I first got there, you know, I watched ECW before I got there because, you know, I was a student at the power plant and... Um, I never thought in a million years I'd be at ECW. I always thought I was going to end up at WCW. And once I got there, you know, watching those guys on, on TV and stuff, I was petrified. I was very, I was, I'm a very introvert person. I, I'm very shy. I'm very quiet. And when I go somewhere that, that I don't know people and I'm uncomfortable, I'm, I'm in a corner by myself and don't say a lot. And my first few months at ECW, that's how I was in the locker room. I didn't speak. I didn't put my boots on until Taz or Bubba or Dream had told me I was wrestling. My first week or so in after when the tryout happened, that whole, when I got my job, I remember a match. I was in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and I did a super kick with Tom Marquez coming out of the corner. I kind of bounced around on, you know, like flamboyant. And when I come to the back and out of the match, Bubba grabbed me and jacked me up in the corner. And in so many words, in classic Bubba style, at the time he told me I was a heel. He used a lot of cussing. He said, you're a heel. He said, Paul loves you. Paul sees something in you. He said, if I see you jumping out, Eric, I'm going to beat your ass. He said, be up and heal. Do we understand each other? And I was like, yes, sir. <laughs> so I, that, that put the fear of God in me with, you know, with doing my job, so to speak. Um, I loved the locker room and I loved how, and it carried on through my days at ECW, how there was no backstabbing there. I've never been in a locker room where, you know, there was no backstabbing. There was no glass ceiling. We all watched everybody's matches, whether you were the first match or your main event. If you stole the show, you know, people were, you guys in the back were high fighting, man. That was a great match. They watched everything. My quit match when I come in the back, everybody watched it. And Balls Mahoney was the first one to greet me and grab me. Yeah, we all supported each other. That was the feeling of the locker room. And the more comfortable I got there, the more it felt like a family. And that's the one thing I've never had anywhere else is that family atmosphere and that family vibe. You know, Bully's right. He was Jack Victory said this years ago that for wrestling to to blow up again, it would have to go back to territories almost. And in some ways, that's kind of what it's doing. I see a lot of great independent promotions with uh, Cody's promotion, MLW, uh, Ring of Honor, uh, Pro Wrestling Grill Out with promotions like that, where you got those loyal followers because fans love independent wrestling. Where would you, a C.W. Anderson today, let's go back maybe 20 years, and he's he's here right now, and he has to choose. What, do you, what company do you think would best suit your style? Would it be a New Japan or Ring of Honor? Which one do you think you would have felt most comfortable with? I know maybe comparing something to like ECW a little bit, but which one would you have felt comfortable in? I think New Japan, being a product of the strong style over in the 2000s, which when I was there with Zero One, more I, I like of New Japan for my love for Japan, either there or you know when I was down at ML, MLW's back, I feel more I feel comfortable there as well. In the locker room, when you guys were you know having each other's back and it was like a family like atmosphere, was the feeling like you guys were like the Island of Misfit Toys? There's been a lot of uh, you know people saying that that's what it kind of was like because. You had the WWE, uh, WWF, you know, at that time back in the Attitude Era. You had WCW and Ted Turner and his money, and of course, you spent time at the WCW plant. So you had, you know, the, you had, you know, the the, the higher end companies. And is it true that maybe you guys had a chip on your shoulder and you had to be the best match uh, when you went out there and topping each other and maybe feeling like you were the island of misfit toys? Uh, uh, to the, to some extent, yes. We were all about company in those three letters and giving those fans their money's worth. Um, Paul had a knack for seeing talent, not just a body and what somebody looked like on the outside, but seeing their mind and their talent. You, know, you look at the guys at ECW from Roadkill, Danny Dorn, myself, Steve Carino, uh, Jerry Lynn, who, who really didn't blossom, so to speak, until he got his run, his big run at ECW. Um, the Dudleys, Raven, every, you know, you could go, the list could go on a Sandman, Dreamer. Paul had a knack for the, those guys that could get them over. WCW, the, the agents or higher ups at WCW literally looked at me and told me I didn't have what it take to make it in this business. They said, you know, I was a, a pretty decent wrestler, but they're a cosmetic company and they didn't think I would have it. And the fans would get behind me and to, uh, to make it in wrestling. That was right before I got my deal or job with ECW. So Paul's knack and, and you could say it was a little chip on our shoulder. I remember one is my very first, not my pay-per-view, but a dark match I did in Chicago um, in 99. It was the night, I think. 
awesome beat Taz to knock a beat. I think it was one of the two. Anyway, Tommy looks at me before I go out. He grabs me. He says, I want you to go out there and steal the show in this dark match. He said, not because you're my friend. He said, because you're one hell of a wrestler. He said, no, I want you to go out there and think about those two at WCW that told you didn't what had what it take to make it this business. And I want you to shove it down their effing throat. He so, said, go out there and beat CW Anderson. So obviously they knew the right buttons to press to get you motivated, to get you inspired. Paul Heyman's been uh, well known to kind of have people run through a wall for him. You know, there's been the stories of bounce checks. Talk about what exactly was it that Paul had, that gift that made you guys run through a wall for him? It was the area we always say that we drank Paul's Kool-Aid. He was that Newt Rockney that could give you that speech and, on so many occasions, just in the couple of years I was there, they had to sit there and listen to him tell us for whatever reason, our checks weren't here this month uh, or this week and we weren't getting paid, but go out there and give those fans. And it's just in his words, go out there and basically do what you do for ECW to give the fans what they want. Um, there was one at a time in Canada. He told us we weren't getting paid because the money was in Canadian. He couldn't, get it switched over or something along those lines to pass. And, you know, Rob Van Dam and I went out there and stole the show in front of 6,000 people. And instead of being a little bitch and saying, I'm not going there because you don't pay me, I went out there and busted my ass, separated my shoulder in that match. And um, it, it was something every, all the time with Paul, but I don't know. It was just the way he, the way he worded it, the, the power behind him and made us believe that he was going to, no matter what we did, he'd make it right. And, I've said on numerous occasions and numerous interviews, I would have followed that man into hell to be a part of ECW. He even asked me one time right before it was a massacre on 34th street. When I beat Tommy, he sat me down and he was like almost tears in his eyes. And he's like, are you going to leave me? I said, what are you talking about? He said, there's rumors you're going to WCW and going to leave ECW. I said, Paul, you and Tommy give me my job when WCW didn't want me. I said, I'm loyal to you. I was raised to be loyal. I said, I would never leave ECW. And, you know, months later, he ended up screwing us. But I would have still been there till the uh, wheels fell off, so to speak. I would have never left ECW. I felt comfortable there. So what are your thoughts when you, either you're watching WWE TV or you're, you hear it through the grapevine that Paul Heyman is now uh, on Monday nights uh, commentating with uh, Jim Ross? I actually watched it. Uh, I, cause he, Paul never called us and never, you know, caught, kiss my ass or anything like that. We're closed. Anything. I found out like most of us by seeing him on raw with Jim Ross. And it felt like somebody had ripped my heart out cause I had worked so long to get to ECW. You know, it was rumors that we were going to close and, you know, the Alabama thing we did, it was everybody was fair, big farewell. But I remember on the ride back to the hotel that I was with Tommy and Franny and Jack, Lou, Steve, all of us traveled together and we're, they're sitting there talking about, that about ECW closing and I'm thinking man this is ECW it can't close why would ECW close it's ECW and damn it didn't when I saw him on Raw and I was like this is it and then of course WWF had at the time had no interest in most of us so it was like a depression spell I went through because I had worked so hard to get there and be on top and beat it you know it was right I was signing my contract at Living Dangerously I was supposed to get the TV title um at Living Dangerously, my world was set, and it was snatched right away from me. So what do you think now to this day is the main reason why everyone will still yell ECW? When you when you go to where the uh, to the arena in Philadelphia, the ECW arena, the, you know, what, why is it that people still walk there and get chills, even though it's been kind of renovated a little bit? They still get chills walking in there. What do you think is a lasting impression of ECW that still hits fans to this day? Fans that are like now into their 40s and now have young kids and they tell them about ECW. But what do you think has been the one thing that's resonated through the test of time that people still talk about ECW? The passion. It, hardcore wrestling just didn't mean we used tables and chairs. It was our wrestling. Fans aren't stupid. They've heard all the stories. They've listened to guys like myself tell these stories of the hard times not getting paid and still going out there and killing ourselves for those for the fans. Um, and it's just it's, an, it's appreciated. They saw what we did. They saw what we put our body through. They know we weren't we weren't making millions of dollars and hundreds of thousands of dollars like the like WWE and the WCW guys were, and lollipopping their way through matches. Uh, we were out there beating the hell out of each other, 
giving them you know four or five star matches. You know, not every show was four or five star matches, but they appreciate the passion. You know, because even the fans, the fans were basically a family too. Everywhere it went, everybody was involved. You know, they chant "We effed up" or "This is all." Awesome. All these chants and stuff they got. You know, it's like the whole arena was one big family. It was something special. It was different. They could watch that other stuff on TV, and then they'd come to us and feel the atmosphere and feel how electric it was when that music would hit. I have a question. That's the one thing. That's the one thing. You know, we, we did a tribute to ECW at WrestleCade uh, this past year where Kid Cash and I wrestled, and I brought all the ECW family out, and they were sitting there chanting ECW. It's, ECW closed in 2001. It's everywhere you go, they still remember because it's the passion. And you're part of the history, CW, so that is uh, something that uh, not a lot of people can say. You're part of a wrestling history, especially uh, with the Attitude Era. And, of course, like you guys probably did start that. You started that, the you know, the hardcore wrestling. So now when you watch these death matches, when you watch these kind of matches where you, you shake your head and you're like, this isn't like ECW did it, what do you think? The, the wrestler today that's doing these kinds of matches is missing the point on, and maybe they should look back at the you know ECW tapes. And I don't want to date it, but when I go to say tapes, but what do you think? Oh, I get it. <laughs> what do you think that they're not getting uh, from the wrestling? The difference between the wrestling in ECW, the hardcore style, and the one that you see now with the death matches and you know the 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 light the the light bulbs and uh, all, all that other stuff that's just unnecessary. What do you think they're missing the point on? The story, making fans, making bringing the fans into it, making it a story. It's it's a male soap opera in that ring, and you have to draw the fans in there and make them part of it, make them believe in it, and tell them a story. It's, it's old school wrestling one hundred and one. Tell them a story. That's why the NWA was was so good, and you didn't have to do so much because the fans believed. And them guys going out there hitting themselves with light tubes, going through barbed wire and light tubes, and exploding this. And it doesn't mean anything because once you do it, okay, what else are you going to do next? There's no story behind it. You're not building the match up for it to mean something. If you just go out there and start beating somebody with a chair after about three or four minutes, what else can you do? If you make it mean something, then that's when the fans get involved and you give them the shock and awe of, of using a table or using a chair because you're not doing it a hundred times. You do it once. That's what Sergeant, Sergeant Bailey Parker told me a long time ago. And I, res- I use that a lot in my telling a story. One day, he, he watched one of my matches, and he said, CW, he said, you have the best punch in wrestling. He said, nobody even comes close. He said, but why are you hitting the guy three and four times with it? He said, hit him once. When you super kick him, super kick him once. Make it mean something. If you keep doing it over and over again, it's lost its meaning. Do it once. It means more. Too many people now kick out of finishers, it's not the same because it kind of makes their finisher uh, meaningless because that's their go-to. That's the one where you know they pull the victory out with that final maneuver. Uh, why has why have we gotten so uh, used to you know kicking out of finishers, and why do you think it's changed that way? In my opinion, it's um, it's almost like to the point of you know at one point with ECW when. Guys were doing things. I remember Ron Simmons saying one time when you know, you're doing so much, what is you going to do next is shoot the guy. The fans are demanding it. The style of wrestling has changed because you can watch stuff now and nobody sells. I've seen guys hit finishers like in the first three seconds of, seconds of a match and they're kicking out of it. It's, it's how you're programming the fans and how us wrestlers are getting programmed by the fans. They're, they're, um, let's see how can I explain it you can't let the fans dictate what you do in the ring because you know it goes back to the when you hear the people chant boring if you let the fans chant let's go there and let them chant you can't let them dictate what you're doing and the, these guys are hitting every finisher in the book and then kicking out of it and then how many times have you seen a match finish with a roll up that's one of the most devastating finishes in wrestling is a roll up because they kick out of everything else and then nobody kicks out of a roll up yeah. So I think the fans have programmed the wrestlers that way and the lack of selling. I've watched some matches and guys, oh my God, it, it, it's frustrating to see them. Just, they don't sell anything. Nobody sells anymore. The bad guys want to be good guys. 
they want to get that that pop. Everybody wants to get that pop. You're, you, if you watch the wrestlers, and they're notorious for it. Uh, I've seen guys on New Japan. I've seen WWE everywhere. They'll do a move and they'll stand up and throw their arms out to the side, almost like Randy Orton. But that's part of his gimmick, where they throw their hand, look at me, look what I did, and they get their finger that give me that cheer for me. It's like they're afraid to get booed. It's like they like that's their job to be disliked. And that was yeah. like a true heel. Was like, listen, they're coming to see me get my ass kicked. That's what they want to do. They want to, you know, I'm gonna, you know, push and push and push, you know, the baby face, and I'm, you know, and I'm gonna insult the hell out of the audience. I don't care what I have to do for them to to boo me. But now it seems like we're in a uh, different, you know, different time where uh, the wrestlers are just afraid to be disliked, to be hated. Yeah, because the thing is, they've hum- they they go out there and they want their merchandise to sell. It's all about merchandising when it comes to that. They don't want to defend the boom because if you hate this guy, I'm not going to go buy his T-shirt. Screw him. So they want to go out there. You know, that's uh, at indie shows. Everybody's selling their merchandise. Everybody's prostituting themselves. Um, and, uh, hell, I'm notorious for it, too. I do it as well, but make that a little bit of extra money. I never did stuff like that in ECW because I was a heel. I didn't go out there and sell T-shirts. And it wasn't until about five years ago that I started doing it. Um, people, like I said, do not want to get the, the heels don't want to. There's really no true heels. Everybody wants to be over because of the sale for their merchandise. I, used to, I had guys that when I was at WrestleMania this past year that come up and they would talk to me and they're like, man, when I was younger, I used to be scared to death of you because you were just so mean and so vicious. That I thought you were the meanest person on the planet. I said, well, then I did my job. CW, uh, I, and listen, I love picking your brain here. This is actually a treat for me, too, because to be talking ECW, to be talking about wrestling the way you know uh, I grew up watching it uh, is really uh, amazing right now, and I want to thank you for your time here. So we're talking about the biggest boom probably in wrestling in a long time, in the last 20 years. There's just wrestling everywhere. One, do you think it's getting a little too oversaturated? And two, what would you think if you were – you know, uh, you know, if the you know the young C.W. Anderson was in this boom right now here for wrestling, how do you think you would have taken advantage of it? I'd have been going to a lot more shows. That's for, for the I answer that first. Um, the out of sight, out of mind. I would have been going to every, trying to get on at Ring of Honor, NXT, anywhere I could. Any any like the the promotion I work for here in North Carolina, the AML that runs Wrestlecade, I'd have been going there. I'd have had my face somewhere to get some kind of job. Um, being oversaturated, I don't think there's oversaturation with the promotions. There's, there is, that can go two ways because there's, there's a lot of good promotions out here. And there's also a lot of crappy promotions that run a lot of crappy wrestlers, um, which kills it for the ones trying to do well, because they'll go to one town that were a very popular, uh, promotion runs like AML. They'll run, you know, five miles down the road for, from them and book crappy talent and nobody's going to come back because they think that's going to be the same thing. I don't know if it's going to be oversaturated. But it's just too near. It's too easy to get in this business nowadays. Anybody can get a pair of boots and you know, call themselves a wrestler. Okay. So it what... should be hard. It should be harder to get in. It should, you, you should have to go. It's like being a policeman. You should have to go to an academy or something, a, tra- a reputable um, school. Not a school where the guy's been in the independent scene for 15 years and never even been on TV or never done anything. You know, he's been in a 10-mile square radius. There's too many of those schools that running around. Um, I've had, when I did, was trained to people, my tryout was really hard. Like, almost, I took notes from the power plant when I went through that tryout and ran kids through there because I didn't want somebody to just sit on their couch and say they could do it. I want somebody that had a heart, had passion for it. And then they would come to my my school, and my school was really hard the first few weeks, and they would leave after the first few weeks, come back six months later by some jackass that trained them, and then if they get in the ring, they say, well, who trained you? C.W. Anderson. Yeah. That's one of the reasons I stopped training is because of that. But I think it should be harder to get into wrestling. It should be harder um, to make it. It's too easy now. What – Star, what I mean, if you have your eye on anybody, do you maybe compare yourself to, or maybe reminds you a little bit of yourself when you watch them wrestle? And uh, maybe are you a fan of any other wrestler right now? 
uh, independent, whether it's WWE, whether he's in Ring of Honor or New Japan or anywhere. Uh, do you see anyone that reminds you of you, and are there any wrestlers out there that you admire today? I like um, I like Tomohiro Ishii from New Japan. He, he reminds me of a lot of me. Uh, he also does the vertical superplex that I did in I did all the time, so he probably got that from me as well. But it's all good. Um, I like him. He's I like watching him work. Um, I like watching Kenny Omega, uh, the Bucks, um, in the States. A lot of Ring of Honor guys. I like watching Low Key because I've known Low Key a long time. Um, it, the guys that were, probably would remind me of myself is the Revival. Yeah, uh, because I, I, I've known I've, I knew them a while before they made it, but they're that classic old school that's what they want uh no flips just fist and they're good kids and when i say kids i don't mean because they're grown men but they're they're real good and they 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 remind me of my younger self so cw if you're for example the rumors coming out this past week that they've asked for the release from the wdb and you know them a little bit i, I think isn't uh, one of them is, is from the north carolina area right he is yeah he he lives uh Around with the Winston Salem out that way, he, okay. you know he's good friends and he really close to one of my extreme horsemen members, John Schuyler. You know, cause John Schuyler, uh, he was a top sp- prospect with Ring of Honor. Mm-hmm. Um, John's everywhere, so yeah, he's really close with John. Okay, so you kind of know their makeup and they're all about the wrestling, like you said, no flips, just you know with the fists. Um, yep. You know, you can you can sense you know. In their in their demeanor, that they are getting frustrated with the tag with the tag team division in WWE. What do you think's happened to tag team wrestling nowadays? Now, don't get me wrong. You know, you have great tag teams like like Ring of Honor's got amazing tag teams. The Briscoes uh, are are one of the first names I think about. They were actually we they were our tag team of the year uh, here on the High Spot Podcast end of the year award show. LAX to me is a great team. Impact Wrestling has got a great mm-hmm. tag team division. Uh, big fans of them. The Young Bucks, of course. Uh, I love them because they tell stories too in the ring it's 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 not about like all these crazy maneuvers they tell stories as well but what do you think has gone wrong in the tag team division in wwe i mean because before that it would be awesome cw because you could always get that maybe that one guy that you know is going to be the blue chipper and you can pair him up because you know you, you knew that that brett was going to outshine you know the anvil you knew maybe that mm-hmm. sean was going to you know outshine marty but you know you put them together you get a good run out of them for two three years and then it helps build up you know that the next star why do you think wwe or bigger companies have gone away from that tag team division where it was just such a simple formula of boom you put this guy here he's the next star you get him some groom in here with with a partner you go on the road you learn all that stuff i mean is it just maybe like instant gratification that we don't have that patience anymore to have maybe wait two or three years for that next top guy I don't think they had the patience to wait because everything in there is rush, rush, rush. And, you know, you go in there, you get eight, especially with WWE, they'll kind of say, okay, you got eight minutes. And then as soon as you just get in the ring, okay, you got six. How the hell are you going to do a tag match in six minutes? Um, for one, I know Vince is not a fan of tag team wrestling. That's why he's never had a good tag team division for such a long time. He's just not a fan. And there's a lot of guys that don't know. There's a, there's a different psychology to tag wrestling. I was, I'm, I'm very good at tag psychology. That was one of my specialties. And Bill Wiles and I had at, uh, at ECW was, was tag psychology. But guys don't know how to do it. They don't know how to do tag psychology. You know, it's all about singles. Because, again, everybody, it's, it's me, me, me. It's hard sharing that limelight and that spotlight. Because there's never going to be another Rock and Roll Express or Midnight Express, who are my two favorite tag teams. There's never going to be those guys again. Because nobody wants to share that spotlight. And nobody can tag wrestle. It's just a different mentality when you go into tag team wrestling. I mean, and head scratcher too because the revival are just so amazing. They don't let them shine, like you said, with a six eight minute match. Mm. Imagine trying to tell C W Anderson and ECW, hey C W, listen, you got a a six minute match that includes the introduction, that includes a commercial break. You know, go out there. I mean, I would I, that that would have to be so frustrating for you as a performer to only have a, maybe four six quality minutes to tell your story and get your moves in and yeah. make sure the other guy gets so it's got to be frustrating as a wrestler so you see wrestlers being frustrated now and now there are other options where would you think that the revival would fit most if for example not that they were going to be granted the release because it would just not ma- make any sense for them to go to like an AEW but where you know you know these guys where do you think they would best fit uh, in tag team wrestling if it's not WWE? 
MLW or Ring of Honor, those, they would thrive in either one of those places. And I think, you know, because the Briscoes are, God, I think the world of uh, Mark and Jay, they're such good guys. They would have great matches with Mark and Jay. Um, they, would, they, would, they would really thrive at Ring of Honor more, but they would also do well at uh, MLW. Because, um, you know, Mark and Jay, they, they understand tag team psychology. They understand tag team wrestling. Um, and I don't, I can't remember. Was, I think Penta and Ray are still the tag champs in MLW. They're two singles wrestlers. Great wrestlers. By no, I mean, they're great workers. They're not wrestlers. They're workers. They're great, but they're not tag team. They're just, there's a difference. And um, Mark and Jay have always been a tag team, even though uh, Jay's a really good singles wrestler. They're a really good tag team together. And we're talking to C.W. Anderson again, man. I mean, awesome insight. Uh, love all of this, uh, you know, talking about ECW. Love talking about the past here. Love talking about, you know, uh, for the wrestling fans that, you know, remember wrestling, you know, before the K- breaking kayfabe, before social media and all that. How much do you think that social media has hurt the wrestling business as far as, you know, maybe the, you know, the heels not wanting to be really, you know, disliked or kind of breaking that thing where you see like a, you know, there's a point where, you know, Roman Reigns like drives through the truck on Braun Strowman. And the next thing you know, they're on the European trip and all of a sudden you see Roman Reigns and Braun Strowman sightseeing. How do you think social media is, uh, you know, done with that? It's killed it. It's killed Kate Fabi. You, you can't because there's too many, there's too easy of an access to, Say like for somebody like myself that was uh, the the heel at ECW, and then you see me with my family or doing Instagram and uh, Facebook live and things like that, and sitting there talking. Uh, my one of my biggest rivals was, at ECW was Tommy Dreamer, and then I Facebook live, and he's in the shot or you know, things like that. It's, it's just killed it because it goes back to the days back in the '80s where fans um, would somehow catch two guys that were wrestling each other. We had a rule at, you know, eating dinner together. We had a rule at ECW that you could not, um, be, go to a restaurant anywhere an hour and a half around the town. Cause Tommy and I, we didn't ride together, but we were in the same clique. And when we were feuding, we had to watch what we were doing. You know, we had to, he'd have to wait and come to the building after us, or he would go ahead and go before us because we were trying to keep pay fade, but the social media, man, it's killed it. It's hard doing that nowadays. C.W. Anderson, and uh, we're going to wrap up here. C.W., uh, obviously, thank you for all your time. So let's play a little one-word association. I always like to play, uh, you know, end it on uh, playing a game here. So let's talk about, okay. uh, you know, one word, two words, the best describes the, you know, the name I'm going to drop to you. So Tommy Dreamer, give me uh, one or two words on Tommy Dreamer, if you can. Great. Great mind. Taz. Uh, tough. Bully Ray. Tougher. Steve Carino. Best friend. Paul Heyman. It's hard to describe. It, it, it's, hard, it's hard to describe Steve in two words. He's been my best friend for twenty five years. Uh, Paul Heyman is an evil genius. <laughs> evil genius. Uh, and so let's talk about maybe, uh, oh, you know what? How about this? Let's, uh, Terry Funk. Legend. And Sand- I'm also the only wrestler I'm scared of. <laughs> <laughs> Sandman. The drunk. <laughs> Sabu. Insane. RVD. Gifted. Jerry Lynn. Underrated. Shane Douglas, the franchise. Um, the originator. And uh, two final ones here. Let's go, uh, someone now. Let's let's talk. Uh, Kenny Omega. Um. Mega superstar. Chris Jericho. Um, a redefined superstar. He is C.W. Anderson talking ECW, talking about the wrestling business. C.W., I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Please 
this is now your platform. Plug away anything that you want to get out there, uh, anything that you're going to be involved in, uh, you know, uh, in the North Carolina area, you, the WrestleCade. Please, you know, this is your time here. Uh, the platform is yours. Uh, you can follow me on social media. Everything I am is ECW Anderson. Twitter, Instagram, uh, Facebook, everything's ECW Anderson. You can check there and you'll see my schedules and where I'm at because I am my schedule is getting packed. Uh, pretty much packed for 2019. Thank you, everybody that's been fans of me for years. If you hated me, like me, I appreciate it. Um, and here at 25 years in the business, I still love this business. And thank you all to the fans that have made me love this business and keep doing it at 48 years old. He is C.W. Anderson. Join us here on the High Spot Podcast and a Bodyslam.net exclusive. Really appreciate it. Look forward to uh, you know seeing what you have up to planned in 2019, and we'd love for you to stop by again. Uh, you know, down the road, and we can talk more ECW stories because I can't get enough of them, man. It's just amazing. <laughs> Absolutely, it's been, anytime. It's, it's been a great time, and I really appreciate appreciate it, C.W. You're certainly welcome. All right, guys, thanks. Go out again to Bodyslam.net and Cassie. Haynes for this interview with C.W. Anderson. Really enjoyed talking to him and hope to have him on the show again. And again, you can follow us on all our social media at High Spot Podcast. You can check out all our work on Bodyslam.net. Listen to us on the Cheap Pops Podcast Network as well as Shining Wizards and B Plus Player Radio Networks. And all I can say is for more exclusive interviews, just keep tuned in to Bodyslam.net and the High Spot Podcast. And we're going to hook you up, guys. So again, Thanks to C.W. Anderson. Thanks to Bodyslam.net. Take care, everybody, on the High Spot Podcast.